picking up around verse 3 in our discussion of Ephesus. Um, some of you have asked, um, my wearing contacts today, no, uh, uh, an apostle laid, eyes on my, laid hands on my eyes and I'm healed. No, no. <laughs> no. I just don't wear them a whole lot. So I normally have them for exercising, but there's a nice little sore here on the back of my ear. So glasses were rubbing on that. So anyway. Uh, Revelation chapter 2 this morning, we're going to continue our study of the seven churches of Asia. Um, class structure will ebb and flow as we go through different parts of Revelation. Sometimes we might be more lectures, sometimes we might be more discussion. The, this section, we're definitely more discussion because it's what we're most familiar with of these seven churches, and there's a lot to talk about as far as modern day application. So, your encouragement, not encouragement, well, I, I like that too. Your in, participation is encouraged. That's what I meant to say there. So, but before we get started, we want to go to God in a word of prayer. And Zach, would you lead us in that word? Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that we're all able to gather here safely and without fear from any authorities telling us not to. We pray that you be with our minds that distractions would stay away and that we're able to clearly focus on your word and learning more about it. Thank you for the congregation that meets here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Zach. Okay, by way of review, we finished chapter one last uh, Wednesday night and we started talking about the seven churches. I got on my soapbox, which often happens, so don't worry, you didn't miss too much if you weren't here Wednesday. Uh, but the, the big points for us to remind ourselves from Revelation chapter 1 is John is commissioned as a prophet to speak what God is revealing to him to the whole church. It's a message in effect for all time. These are seven literal churches and there's real messages to them that we're going to be looking for. Uh, but each of the letters does end with, he who has ears to let him hear Listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. That's in, that's in, that indicates to us that these messages are for all time. Okay? And there's the blessing in verse 3 about anyone who reads the words of this prophecy and keeps it, then you know, there's a blessing upon them. Um, that's the first of several blessings in the book. Uh, when we start Ephesus, we need to remind ourselves that each time Jesus describes himself in these letters, more often than not, it's a reference back to the vision at the end of chapter 1, um, where Jesus is depicted as this, 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 this person in the midst of the seven lampstands who held the seven stars in his hand, who has a sword coming out of his mouth and the eyes like fire and the bronze and the gold and all that stuff. And again, that's a parallel to Daniel 7, identifying Jesus as the same ancient of days or the son of man coming up to the ancient days of that chapter. Okay, so... Think back to our class on John's use of the Old Testament revelation. Sometimes you have to go backwards in order to go forward. And it makes sense that the last book of the canon would kind of start tying up, tying together everything in the Bible, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of Genesis imagery in Revelation. Makes sense. That's the beginning. We're at the end now. But anyway, um, Ephesus, a lot good, but there's a big but to that, Right? There's a lot good about Ephesus, but they were lacking in one thing. And that's where we're going to start off this morning. Very briefly, we talked about a little bit last Wednesday night. So if you're here Wednesday night, don't give it away for anyone else. <laughs> but what do you think it means to have lost your first love? In fact, while you're thinking about that, let's actually read this beginning section so we can just get our minds on it. So... Revelation 2 and verse 1, from the Legacy Standard Version of your Bibles, it reads, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, This is what the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot bear with those who are evil, and you put to test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false, and you have perseverance, and have endured for my name's sake. You also have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember where uh, you have fallen, 
and repent and do the deeds you did at first. But if not, I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place, unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that, which you, hate, uh, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has ears to let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So again, focusing on um, verse 4. What do we think it means to have left their first love? Kathleen? They kind of lost their passion and their commitment for serving Christ. Okay, so I would definitely say that that's, that's a big component of it. They've, what Kathleen said, they've kind of lost their passion and commitment to service. Hmm. Anything else to that? Gabriel? I'm thinking that they are no longer putting Christ first in their lives because having a love for Christ means we put him first. That's what he wants us to do. Mm-hmm. And if we let anything else get in the way, money, jobs, family, whatever, he's not first. He needs to be first. Okay. So it might have been that they were no longer putting Christ first. Now, let's take those two comments. I want to explore them a little bit deeper. Can I put Christ first in my life without serving my brethren? Yes. Oh, we have two conflicting answers. So, Andy, why do you say yes? Well, because 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 have read, for example, in Galatians 6, uh, for around verse 2, that we are to help each other bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Mm. So, something to think about, right. okay? We want to have our thoughts on Christ all the time, mm-hmm. but that also means service. Paul, you want to give your answer? Are your brethren not part of Christ? Brethren are in Christ, okay? So... Let's think about, and those are good, those are good answers, but we're, we're fleshing them out, right? To put Christ first is to not grow weary in service, which also means that we're, we have a living faith, not a dead paper one, as I like to call it. Your faith is flesh and blood in the world, not a piece of paper that goes on a wall like a diploma, right? Um, this certifies you're a Christian, and, you know, never once has anyone asked me to show my history diploma. Never once. It just sits on my wall to remind me that I spent all that money for four years of classes I don't remember. Anyway, <laughs> that's not the faith, right? Faith is what you actually practice every single day in accordance with the gospel. So, uh, so with that, and I do see the other hands, um, as we talk about this a lot Wednesday night, I don't want to go too much into it, but to put Christ first, and I think that's a good way of putting it, is you cannot pursue sound teaching to the neglect of service. You can't. Uh, and as we talked about last week, uh, or last, not last week, Wednesday, uh, it seems that this congregation had gotten so concerned with heresy hunting or refuting false teaching, they had forgotten the second greatest commandment. To love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? Because, and this is a scary quote, you can have all the correct doctrines of God and still end up condemned to hell. You can. Because if you're not putting the faith into practice and loving and serving your brethren and your fellow man, you're missing a big component of of God, of the gospel. That's something that Jesus routinely rebuked the Pharisees and Sadducees for. That's something that Jesus called out repeatedly in his ministry. Um, And it seems here that in their their fervency to stand for truth, which, by the way, Jesus is not condemning that. We need to stand for truth, and we need to be uncompromising on that. But they had done so to the neglect 
of service and love of brethren. So um, that was the point I wanted to make. Um, Steve, do you still have a comment? Okay. Uh, Andy? But one thing like that is, is well, well, so suppose I have the opposite problem with the good news is they're doing the servers, they're serving one or whatever, but, 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 but they're completely falling away from the truth, even though they're serving one and all that, they're, right, that's a problem too, and that'd be a problem yes, too. Yes, it is. But yeah, that's for problem. Ephesus, that was not their problem. Ephesus' problem was they were overemphasizing doctrine and not the service. Right, and, and, and if someone can't do both, but someone truly can't do both. You do one or the other, not uh, both. We are expected to do what we're able to do. Okay, and we can talk more about that after class, and we've talked about that several times. So, all right. So in this letter, then, that's, that's the big issue. So we start talking about this Wednesday night, but what is the solution to this issue? If, I, if I'm like Ephesus, let's say I am, and I recognize that I have all the correct doctrines of God, I, 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 I can argue Bible with the best of them, but I'm lacking in love, what's the solution? Steve, since... You didn't get to make the comment last time. When Peter was, when Jesus was talking to Peter, he, he asked him a question three times. He says, do you love me? And the thing is, what is loving Christ? And Jesus said loving Christ was taking care of, and, and of the brethren, loving the brethren. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what you've got to do, the first thing a person should look at, in fact, what a Christian should always be looking at is himself. You should always be gauging why he's doing what he's doing, why he's saying what he's saying, why is he making the decisions that he's making. And almost every time he does that, he should be asking himself, you know, is, am I doing this to make me look better, or am I doing this to make God look better, to make the church grow, to mm -hmm. help my brethren? And, and if you ask yourself, if you get in the habit of asking yourself that question, it's like putting on spiritual blinders. You find that you don't go down pathways that before seemed so tempting and so easy. Uh, and so really just self-examination is a, is, is a really important thing that a lot of people don't do anymore. And, and I think that's part of what the Ephesians were do. They're so focused on being wholly right and defending the, the, word, the, the word against false teachers and stuff that they have forgotten that that love was, was supposed to be applied to one another and that it was love. It wasn't just the pursuit of, of intellectual uh, rightness. Okay, so foundation for this is we need to have a healthy dose of self-examination. Uh, Paul, Russ, and then Rob. Paul. I mean, the solution Jesus gives is quite simple. He says, remember. Mm -hmm. Because it wasn't right doctrines that brought them to Christ. It, when you, when you come to Christ, you only have a very basic understanding of what Christ is all about. It wasn't knowing everything that made them choose Jesus and enter into heaven with him. It was love of Jesus. Mm. So remember that. Right? You, know what, you know what it's like. You were there once. Just go back to that. He says repent. That is to return. So Paul points out the solution is repentance. That they were once in a correct balance, if we will, love and truth. And they had got imbalance. And Paul brings a really good point. Uh, it wasn't knowing the Bible perfectly or having all the correct doctrines of God that saved them. It was trusting in the love of Christ that saved them. We might summarize that plan. So remember that and go back and do the things you did at first. And that's the thing we left off Wednesday night was if you've fallen from a place, maybe you've lapsed a little bit, here's the good news. You know what the healthy spot is which means you can get back to it, which you're capable of getting back to it, because you were there once before, right? It's kind of like if you were in shape at one point in your life, maybe you exercised a whole lot, maybe you had a running habit, and you stopped doing that for several years. You know you're capable of doing that. might take a lot of work to get back there, but you're capable of getting back there. So, Russ? You and Paul covered exactly what I was okay. going to bring up. Thank you. Thanks, Russ. It's not the same thing. Okay. Kurt. Um, Maybe I'm oversimplifying this. Uh, Please do. But in a, yeah, in a sense, we've all left our first love. Mm. Okay? When we were that new convert, there was a sense of zeal and just excitement about being in the body. And over time, I think we all, in a sense, get complacent and lose some of that. 
And I wonder if this could be something that simple. They lost that zeal, the, that first love that they had. And that's something we do need to repent of and get back to. So it might be something that simple. It might not be this big, horrible sin. It's just like us, we just need to get back to where we were. And I really appreciate you bringing that up. And it's, I don't think it's oversimplifying. It's, we think about it, we're at the end of the first century. So we're probably in the second gen of Christians just beginning, and um, those of you who've grown up in Christian households, uh, maybe you are the second or third generation, some of us aren't, um, it is a challenge because when you grow up in a righteous climate, when you grow up with godly parents, when you grow up with Bible teaching, it just, you take it for granted. And as second gen Christians, it's just, uh, just, studies and anecdotal just talking to preachers and stuff um there's sometimes a challenge that goes on with that because you know some start questioning is do i believe this because this is what mom and dad said or do i believe this because i've come to these conclusions from the bible and so sometimes in the second gen you you get that complacency and you you have to work to get through that and to kurt's point this happens to all of us it does we do have that new convert zeal. We, we, we're super excited about the Bible. Everything's new. Everything's fresh. It's all amazing. And then somewhere we kind of peter out and we just start coasting. And so the Ephesus problem is, that, is actually a problem. It's an ebb and flow that we're going to wrestle with the rest of our life of we'll have these moments of great zeal and growth and sometimes they're followed by complacency and then we have to work to get out of that and, and keep growing, right? Uh, this morning's lesson, for example, um, wasn't really sure how to start it, and then I was writing the Bolton article, and I, I was just thinking back to, well, when I was a new convert, and hearing stuff about the church for the first time, and how impressive and fantastic and amazing it was that, you know, I'm not going to preach a sermon right now, but just, I went back to that zeal, and thinking about that, and that's how I'm going to preach it this morning, because it's, sometimes you have to remind yourself of, of, what you were doing at first, right, in order to get out of the rut. So, a uh, couple more comments and we need to push, push on. So, Chuck? First John chapter 4, it tells us God is love. If we abide in love, God abides in us. Mm -hmm. So, I think the solution would we lose what they had lost, we have to go back and renew our love for God so that he'll abide with us. Mm -hmm. So we have to go back to that first love. So, uh, Karen. The repentance covers it, but he also includes and do the first words, yeah. which, when any time the Bible has repeated itself, stands out as extremely important. Right. This, this return back to the first love is not just saying, oh yeah, I should go do that actually following through with it you know uh, going back to serving and doing all those things so uh, don't have time for the other hands I do see um, so let's just very briefly look at verse 7 uh, so he who is an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches to him who overcomes I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God so this is what I like to call the admonishment for all time section even though the whole book is for all time but this is specifically the kind of catch-all verse of, of this letter. Uh, what do we think it means? Um, how are we admonished here for a modern day reader? Andy? Yeah. Well, um, well, it says, well, the Luke translation says, everyone who's victorious, I will give through life. And so it, it, so, so it means everyone, I mean, someone, whoever figures it right all out and, and does good enough, then they'll be able to they'll, they'll eat from the true tree of life because they're, they were successful. Can you repeat the first part of that verse? Well, to everyone who is victorious, I will give the fruit from the tree of life in the pleasure and the paradise of God, which is the new living translation. So what that means there is, is anyone who is successful, who, who manages to succeed in what he's trying to do and does it perfectly, will, will, will be able to eat from the tree of life. So if, it's about to be good enough there, I think. Okay, so we're reading a little bit too much into that verse, okay? Uh, very quick question for a class, and just blur it out if you have it. How are we victorious in our spiritual life? How do we gain the victory? Faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus. 
which we might also translate as loyalty to Christ. Our victory is not based upon how perfectly we keep God's law. Okay? Titus 3, verse 5. He saved us not on the basis of deeds done in righteousness, but by the washing, regeneration, and renewing by the Holy Spirit. That happens at conversion. So, um, the idea here is the one who perseveres in their faith to the very end, they have gained the right, or God will grant them the right, to eat of the tree of life. And there's a really cool thing that's happening here. Um, maybe you want to drop in your Bibles. Go back to Genesis 3. Um, everything that was lost in Genesis due to sin is restored in Revelation thanks to Christ. So, the in, I just read this yesterday in my Bible reading. Um, consequence of the fall, man and woman's eyes were opened. We knew right and wrong. Shame entered the world. Fear of God because we sinned. And I'm using the editorial we here. Also, the, the access to the tree of life was removed. And there's, I think there's two things in that. One is, it's as consequence of sin, we're removed from that. But also, if you read the text there, God says within himself, um, so that man may not reach for it, let us remove him from the garden. So in the punishment, there's also the re recognition that they're not ready for this. Okay? So, at the in Revelation, though, we're getting a picture at the end of time, on parts of it, we're being showed of what's going to happen when man has become ready to eat of that tree of life again, or for the first time. So, we're starting to see at the end of Revelation, end of this letter here, is what was lost in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 is being regained in Revelation. So, final comments or questions here? Tom. How are we admonished? Um, it says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's specifically written to the churches, but if you're reading this or hearing this, I'm talking to you too. Right. And what did Ephesus have to overcome? Ephesus had to overcome, I think Kurt's right, of just Ephesus had to overcome the, the complacency or apathy that sets in after you've been a Christian for a, for a longer period of time. That's what they had to overcome. And so the lesson for us is we need to overcome that same thing. Okay. So uh, moving on to. Oh, I need to make a few more points here. Excuse me. Um, we will deal with the Nicolaitans um, later on in the chapter. Um, but interesting. Uh, back here on the consequence, if they do not repent, Jesus will remove their lampstand. Just a because people have asked questions about that in the past. Um, just what it is, go back to Revelation 1 and verse 20, lampstands are identified as the churches. So if they do not repent of their lackluster, Jesus removed the lampstand. How I understand that is, they may say they're a, the, the, a congregation of God, they may say they're a church that belongs to Jesus, but if they don't solve this issue, what God's saying is, you won't be my people. You will not be considered a lampstand in this vision anymore. You're not going to be a congregation. Uh, you may still meet, you may still call yourselves that, you may still proclaim that, but if you don't have these deeds, if you don't have the balance, you're not. Which is that old age-old biblical principle of you shall know them by their fruits, right? So, okay, Smyrna. Pick up in verse 8, we'll read through verse 11. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, This is what the first and the last, who was dead and who has come to life, says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast you into prison, uh, some of you into prison, so you will be tested, and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will never be hurt by the second death. Okay, same questions, but it's important we go through these. So how does Jesus describe himself to the church of Smyrna? Zach? As the first and the last. And also there's um, reconfirmations of the fact that he died and was resurrected. 
Okay, so that we're going back to uh, some of the language used to describe God in Genesis and Genesis. Revelation 1. And what do we think first and last conveys? What, what's, what do we think that means? In Revelation 1 was, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Ron? Jesus is always there. Always there. He encompasses everything, right? Now, why do we think Jesus' emphasis on he was dead and has, has lives again is emphasized to Smyrna? Russ? Perhaps some of them were about to be put to death. Right. So, what we're going to, as we're starting to see, is oftentimes the way Jesus describes himself at the beginning of each of these letters, there's a specific character trait or point about God that that specific church needs to know. Smyrna, of the first set of letters, is the one church that has no need of repentance. There's nothing in this letter that says that. They have great need of encouragement. And so what is being emphasized about God to Smyrna is he is in all, he is above all, he has a power over all, which includes death and life. See, when you get stressed and anxious and you're being persecuted, you get tunnel vision. And sometimes, it's not just blinders up, but you can't see above you either. And this is a really poor illustration, but it's a tunnel, you know. And sometimes, you forget who God actually is. The Israelites, coming out of Egypt, had just saw God do all those wonderful miracles and amazing feats of power, and then they get to the Red Sea, and what do they do? They despair, and they panic, and they think they're going to die. God just blotted out the sun for a whole day. God just, you know, did all these amazing things. You, you think he can't part the Red Sea. But if you read that chapter, you read their pronouns, Israelites kept on focusing on Egypt, 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 Egypt. And I would submit to you similar things happening here. These Christians, and we can't really fault them because if we're in the same situation, we'd be just as terrified. Their pronouns are probably Rome. Rome. What's Rome going to do? What's Rome going to do? What's the governor going to do? Instead of keeping their eyes focused back on God, who God is, what God is doing, what is God capable of. So here, they're being encouraged or admonished. So in verse 9, um, I'm not going to give away that stuff. So, okay, I fixed that this morning, and apparently I didn't save it, so... My bad. That's Pergamum, uh, Smyrna. Okay. So what does Christ commend Smyrna for in verse 9? What's good about this congregation? Gabrielle? He's expressing that he's aware of their tribulation, mm. which has to be huge. If I put myself in and what they must be going through, I can't even imagine the despair, the fear of what's going to happen to them very soon. Right. And he's saying, don't focus on that, focus on <clears throat> what comes afterward, because likely they're going to die. Yeah. And we're afraid of dying, aren't we? So what, one thing that Jesus does here is, one, he, he acknowledges they're suffering. They're seen, right? And sometimes, when we're going through trials and tribulations and we're suffering, sometimes that's all we need. Somebody just to validate and say, hey, I, I see the pain you're going through. They, I, you don't need answers. You don't need them to fix it. Just the fact that somebody has seen your pain. And Jesus commends them for the fact that they have remained faithful even in the midst of what they're going through. Now, Gabrielle, you, you brought up a point. I want, I want to give some fun, not fun facts, but some more background information on of just thinking about the fear and the anxiety and what these Christians would be going through. Anyone know the origin of the Christian fish symbol? Um, I wish I had a whiteboard. You know, it's, okay. 
Uh, the Greek word for fish, which I can't remember, in the first century was an acronym. They took each letter of that word, and basically it, it stood for the followers of Christ meet here, whatever it was. Romans had, it just looked like graffiti on walls, but an early Christian practice during times of persecution was small graffiti. They wouldn't put the letters in there, but they would just draw the fish. And wherever the noise, the nose pointed, that was where the meeting location was that week. Because they did have to change where they met week to week. Because, as we're going to see here, some would betray them, some would find them and rat them out, some would try, Roman authorities were trying to get rid of them. Uh, because if you're being labeled as seditious conspirators and treason, uh, treasonous traitors to the Roman state, well, Rome, Rome doesn't care if you're worshiping other gods. Rome does care if you're being traitorous and treasonous. And that was the favorite slanderous tactic the Jews would use against Christians. Uh, and so think about that. Think about week to week. I mean, let's put more in context. Our brother in China, I keep bringing it up because I know about the situation pretty well over there due to some friends and stuff. You can't email the meeting location because the government watches the emails. You can't text people about the meeting location because the government sees all the text. You, you have to, I mean, when, when the Chinese Communist Party is coming after you, you have to be very clandestine. And think about just the base level of anxiety and fear that will come with that. And the dissidents. There's the natural desire and impulse that God has built into us of, hey, I like living. I don't want to die. That's why you panic and you try and breathe when you're starting to drown. You're, you, God designed you to where you're trying to not drown. But also, there's the other side of, I still need to worship my Lord and Savior. And that might come with consequences of dying. And you can imagine the fear and the anxiety that goes into that. And I would submit to you, this is what the church at Smyrna is going through. So a couple more points here. Um, so, he knows their poverty, but you are rich. This is, seems very similar to what Jesus uh, said back in Matthew chapter 5, um, verses 11 and 12, where in the Beatitudes there, he, he promises those who suffer persecution for his name's sake that they, they are rich and they will inherit the kingdom of God. Um, now, some interesting things here, uh, where he says they are Jews, but not Jews. Um, Romans 2, 28 through 29, I just jot that down there. Uh, but there Paul talks about a Jew is not one who is Jewish outwardly, but one inwardly, not the circumcision of the flesh, but the circumcision of the heart. But as in the first century, the Jews would identify the term Jew as a, a follower of God, a disciple of, uh, you know, one of God's people. And Paul's whole point in Romans 2 is, no, no, the people of God are the people who have the heart of God. The people of God are the ones who do the things that God wants them to do. Um, so, uh, a couple more things here. So, the description of Jews here as the synagogue of Satan um, is pretty interesting. Um, I think this is more of a, not a literal description of a synagogue that actually worships Satan, uh, but pretty much a, a shaming technique or a naming, name calling or whatever you want to call it, a descriptor of what these Jews in this city were actually doing, uh, what in effect their actions were. Um, so Romans did not make a distinction between Jews and Christians. Um, that's why for the majority of the first century, Christians really didn't suffer state persecution because Judaism was a protected religion. Um, it was tolerated, it was thought weird, but the Jews had been in the empire long enough that they were given protected status, which means Christians kind of went underneath the radar on that too. Because as far as Romans are concerned, you're both this weird religion that worships one God. Okay. And you see in the book of Acts, when Paul gets brought before Felix and Festus, oftentimes is the Roman authorities like, what do I have to do with your weird debates about your law and Moses? It doesn't matter to me. Uh, but after 70 AD, when the temple gets destroyed, Jews started making a more pointed effort to make a distinction. 
We need to get these Christians away from us. We need to make sure that Roman authorities know that they're not us. And so it's very easy to see how the Jews would be basically Rome's eyes. And this kind of happened even before that. You see that in the book of Acts, right? Oftentimes the Jewish authorities would bring a complaint to the Roman governors or they would tell the Roman governors about what these Christians are doing. Um, and after the first century, we do have that letter applying the elder to the emperor uh, about asking him, what should I do with these Christians? And the whole reason why he even knows there's Christians in this province is because there's people who used to be Christians who are informing on these Christians where they're meeting and their assembly locations and that kind of stuff. So in effect, these Jews are carrying out the work of Satan, even though they're not worshiping Satan, because they're bringing about persecution of God's people. Okay? Um, that's one potential way of looking at it. Um, so, any comments or questions thus far? I know that was more background information on some of the stuff in Smyrna, but... Okay. So a couple more things here uh, about Smyrna. Um, so, they're encouraged to not fear. Um, nope. Let's talk about that, verse 10. Um, verse 10 and 11, I mean, 11 will apply to us too, but 10 and 11 is kind of the application for them and us, so let's deal with both at the same time. So how is Smyrna encouraged to remain faithful at the end of this letter? Jack? Um, he gives an idea of what they should be expecting which to humans is comforting mm -hmm. even when it's bad news we want to know what to expect um, so he does that but then he also mentions once you've endured that uh, he, he will be given a crown of life right so part of the Alpha and Omega description there at the beginning of the letter um, Again, emphasizing that Christ knows all, and he's over all, he has authority of all, which means he can tell them what's going to happen. And he's telling them this, this coming wave of persecution will be limited in scope, right? Ten's not a number we went over, but it's not any of the completed numbers, right? It's not any of the fullness numbers, right? Um, <clears throat> and so... Just, the, just knowing what's going to happen, and it's going to be limited in scope, and they'll be able to endure it, would be of great encouragement, right? Um, you know, I, I think as on road trips as a kid, you know, as a kid, you don't really, not for a long time, I don't think you have a, any real sense of time or distance. And so I remember when we drove from Oregon to California for Disneyland, it felt like an eternity, and yet, having done that driving as an adult, it's fairly quick because you have that conceptualization of time and everything. You know the end point. You know where you're trying to get. Mom and Dad did not tell us when we're stopping. I didn't know we're going to stop halfway through in Sacramento to stay the night. You know, I thought we're driving all the way through, and so it's just, oh. I think something similar is happening here. You don't know when the end of persecution is coming. It, could, it feels like a big wait, right? But if God were to tell you, hey, there's an end point, and here's the end point. You know, hypothetically, you pretend they had a calendar. You could put that end point on the calendar and say, okay, that's when it's going to end. I can endure until then. I can keep going. Uh, I also submit to you verse 10. End of verse 10 of chapter 2 is a good summary verse for the whole book. So if you just want to commit that verse to memory, you, you'll know the whole message of Revelation is being faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. Um, okay, so how are we then admonished today from, from this lesson? What are the applications? What are the lessons? What stood out to you? What, what can we draw from, from this letter? Chris? Knowing that uh, we go through trials and, and temptations in our lives, uh, we can still have that crown of life ourselves. So even though the the first church, church, first church in Ephesus, and then you're saying that 
in Smyrna, there weren't any weren't anything that they were condemning them for. But still, in our lives today, each individual of our lives, we 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 know we have the crown of uh, the crown of life if we're like you said, loyal to Jesus. Right. So the reward is the same, and the encouragement is still the same. And one little practical thing that a friend of mine told me and I was really stressing out about something in, in college. Um, he just said, just think about a year from now, is what you're worrying about going to matter? And I will tell you what, that has been the most helpful kind of like mantra I've ever been told in my entire life. Because most of the time when I ask myself that question about the things I'm worried about, things I'm enduring, things I'm scared about, the answer is no. It isn't going to matter a year from now. That's because I can look back on 29 years worth of life and go, nothing I worried about in the moment <laughs> was really going to matter a year from, that, from then. Um, but that goes back to the fact that these Christians were given an end point and they knew that there was an end coming. Big picture stuff for us, we know there's an end point and the end will come. Now it's a little bit hard because we don't know when the end of time is going to be, but we're told it will end and that's when all the rights, uh, all wrongs will be righted. So, Couple of hands, Nancy, Andy, and then Chuck. Nancy? I was just thinking what you just said about in a year from now, you can extrapolate in a week from now, mm -hmm. in a month from now. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you just put that through your head and it's like, okay, maybe in a week, maybe in a month. No. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Just add it to it. Right, and we can go back to Matthew 6, I believe, no, Matthew 7, when Jesus teaches about anxiety. He ends there of my paraphrase, worry about today. You don't know tomorrow, you can't change the past. Each day has enough trouble on its own. I mean, that's, you know, that's a biblical principle behind these larger uh, sayings. So, anyway, Andy? Yeah, um, uh, um, 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 two things. Um, first of all, when you said it's Matthew chapter 7, actually it's Matthew chapter 6, and in, chapter, in, in the Matthew chapter 6 we're talking about not, not Matthew chapter 7. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, and, and another thing is, 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 is if the, the one thing, so I'm not sure how I apply today, it says, because the New Living Translation says, the devil will throw some of you in prison to test you, you will suffer for 10 days. How does that apply today? I mean, is he going to put everyone in prison? I mean, if that's, that's true, I mean, <laughs> what, 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 the one we see in the prison, new Christians in prison for, for, for 10 days for each, each Christian then? Nope, that's not an MRN application. That was for Samira. Okay. That was what was going to happen to them. Okay. There might be a larger principle here about whatever Satan throws at us. Uh, it will be limited in scope and okay. we can endure it. So, okay, thanks. Uh, Chuck McCann. Chapter 11 talks about the second death. This, to me, I think is the hardest thing for people of the world to understand. We know, like what it tells us in Chapter 10, when we die, only two things are going to happen. We're going to either get the crown of life or we're going to have the second death. Mm -hmm. But people don't understand the second death. It's not something that's just going to be where they are no longer accountable or know what's going on. It's going to be separation from God and eternal punishment. And I think the things that are going on today, people kind of either just brush it aside. But that, that is a very strong comment when we talk about the second death. Right. All right. We'll talk more about this in a minute. So, Captain. So, 10, the, the, the 10 days really just means limited scope. We can't figure anything else out from that. I don't think so. Um, in, in my studies, I haven't really found anything on the significance of 10 there. I think it's the only time it shows up in the book. I think for Smyrna, because these are real churches, again, uh, it's either limited in scope as far as what their their imprisonment's going to be, or it's a literal 10 days. So, uh, but the idea is Jesus telling them whatever they're about ready to endure, there is an end point and it's going to come fairly quickly for them. So, Kurt, you had something to add? Uh, Oversimplifying oh, again. The, the lesson for here is the those in Smyrna could maintain their faith, could stay pure. We can too. Yeah. Hmm. Right. And again, the, the steel is here, here um, the, the overcome is almost repeated in every letter, and so what does Smyrna have to overcome? Uh, the need for endurance, right? They have to continue to endure. And so for us today, there's a continued need for us to endure when it comes to our faith here. So, 
And remember, too, we can't do it on our own. Right. Mm -hmm. why, why, again, this is our church. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, that's time for class. So Wednesday night, we will pick up here. I have a few comments to make about the second death. Um, just remind, uh, as a reminder, um, there's a reason why Jesus points out in Revelation 1 verse 18 that he has the power of, he has the keys over death and Hades, the unseen room and death. He controls that. And so the fact that if you overcome Christ as the authority over that, he gives you the ability to not fear the second death because if you're in him, you're victorious over that. You don't have to fear it. You have the eternal life. So, uh, but we'll pick up there and we'll press on in our study there.